Hello, Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session and to our first Dialogue Edit Mix Master Challenge. And we're not going to waste any time. We are going to jump right in today. Welcome to all of my esteemed guests. We have Mike Delgadio. We have Austin Olivia Kendrick. We have Alan Williams. I'm not pointing the right direction because I'm entirely disoriented. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us here. Having us. Got to bring down my audio level or bring back up my audio level. It's going to be great. We're, Good we're time. all on mute. We're all on mute. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> all being very respectful. Thank you so much. Um, let's jump right in. So um, each of you have been on the channel before at various times. Um, but let's, for those that haven't, that missed some of those sessions, let's go ahead and do some introductions first. Austin, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and what your background is, what you do? Um, hi, I am Austin Olivia Kendrick. Um, I am a professional dialogue editor, a member of IATSE Local 700. Uh, I currently work at Nickelodeon Animation, and most people probably know me as that nerd who rants about sound on TikTok. So, <laughs> glad to be here. Thank you so much, Austin, for being here. It's a pleasure to have you back. All right, next up, Mr. Alan Williams. I am a boom operator that works in the film industry. I do motion picture, television, that kind of thing. Uh, just wrapped on a show called Legacies on uh, WBCW tele uh, CW WB TV. Um, that was this last Wednesday. And um, that's what I do, basically. I, I, I'm the guy that holds the boom over the people and manage the set for the sound department. And uh, basically, that's that's what I do. And uh, with that's a what lot, I love doing. I'm with sorry? a lot of hours. A lot of hours with, with headphones a lot of hours. on. With a lot of Listening hours. Listening very carefully. OK. Yeah. All right. Then over to Mr. Mike Delgadio. And you can find Alan on his SoundSpeed's YouTube channel. Oh, yes. For, forgot, to, forgot to plug himself. Uh, <laughs> my name is Mike Delgadio. I'm a full-time voice actor, and I make videos on YouTube to help uh, new and aspiring voice actors set up their home studio. Technical perspective stuff. You can find me on on YouTube as Booth Junkie. Just as the like T-shirt does. Yeah. 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 Gotta, gotta, right. gotta, Perfect gotta, plug. Get my gear, right? <laughs> <laughs> well... Thank you all so much for being here and for lending your expertise. And uh, it's super kind of you to take time off your weekend to, to help out here. We had people submit their audio samples. So in each of these cases, it's a, it's a, these are all talking, you know, just spoken word type recordings. Um, they're a little bit different. We had a, we had six that were submitted. We're going to have time for three today, but we'll come back and we'll do another episode at some point here, but before too much longer, but we're going to go over three of them today. Um, some of them were done in sort of recording studio booth kind of situations. Some of them were done for online courses. So there'll be a video component with them. Another one was more of kind of like a field recording. So we've got a good mix here. So what I wanted to do is, uh, go ahead and jump in and show you uh, the first one, and we'll, we'll actually first, I'm going to share the uh, the background information. So this one was submitted by Peter Locke, who I think I just saw in the chat there. Yes, Peter's here. So thank you, He's Peter, here. for submitting this. Yep. And um, Peter said he used a, an Electro Voice RE20, neutral setting, foam windscreen, five inches, lots of detail here. Um, thank you for that. We're recording into a Mix Pre 6.2, low cut filter at 80 hertz, gain 55 trim at just past halfway and then of course recorded to a stereo mix processed entirely in rx9 using declick mouth declick ds breath control gain reduction phase nectar 3 compressor and loudness control setting it to minus 17 lufs so that is what peter is coming at us with and i want to just cue up the audio recording here. Peter was kind enough to send us a before and after. And so I just want to show you what that looks like here. So here is the before. And actually, I'm going to go big screen on this here so people can see. So here is before. And then here is after. And we'll go ahead and play this really quickly. Marching to your own beat. The class was unsettled on this spring day. And the teacher was not confident the subject would capture their imaginations. She bravely plunged into a description of trilobites. Young Curtis felt he did not have to pay attention, as he could listen later to his Zoom H1 recording. Emma was over by the window, looking wistfully at the playing field and dreaming of her band winning the competition. 
but sitting closer to the front was Danielle. She had already read the text, and her drawings of these Cambrian critters were very detailed. Okay. <laughs> there we go. That is what uh, Peter submitted for us. So this one, there was a lot of RX post-processing. Uh, Austin, you want to take a, take, a, take a look at that first and give us your impressions? Definitely. Um, as a dialogue editor, I live and die by Isotope RX, um, so I'm very familiar with the program. Um, I would say a good job in terms of picking the blanket plugins for cleaning, the declicking, the mouth declick, you know, that was very solid choices. Um, I know that um, breath control can sometimes be a little hit or miss. Um, I think that um, potentially you might have gotten a more like um, a, a cleaner result if you had gone in and kind of manually cut out the breaths. I know it's annoying. I know it's a tedious process, but it's something that can give a really clean product. Um, uh, I would challenge you because you, the, the choices that you made in the blanket plugins, it shows me that you are familiar with RX. Um, so I would challenge you to kind of dig in even further on the spectrogram, you know, zoom in on that spectrogram, find those little clicks and pops that the, that slip past the declip, uh, declick plugins and start, you know, paint brushing them out, you know, really start kind of getting surgical with it. I, I didn't. That's a way to kind of push yourself and push the quality of, uh, of your finished product. Um, I would also say to start playing around a bit more with EQ. Um, I definitely think like a little bit of a high pass filter to kind of roll off that lower end, kind of get rid of some of that, of that little bit of room or machine noise. Um, and maybe like play with adding some, some decibels on, uh, on like the higher end, just to add a little bit, a little bit of sparkle. A little bit of, of brightness to it. Uh, but I thought it was really, really solid. Um, yeah. Awesome. Austin, Thank are you familiar with, um, I'm, I was not familiar. He said he's using the Nectar compressor. Are you familiar with that? Because I, I felt like I heard the noise floor fluctuating in and out. And I didn't know if that was a, a, a byproduct of the Nectar compressor um, or where that may be coming from. You hear right after he makes mm -hmm. the introduction to the title, you can hear the noise floor come, come in and out, yeah. almost, almost breathing. Yeah, I'm not all that familiar with Nectar um, as a compressor, unfortunately. Um, I would also suggest like potentially for that kind of noise floor coming in and out, maybe doing a pass of uh, a light voice denoise, very light, just to kind of even that out. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I'll have to look into Nectar a little bit. Nectar, Nectar's isotopes, uh, it's kind of their... It's their voice. It's, it's a little voice module. It's got a compressor, an EQ, a de -esser. Um, kind of just a simple, you know, if you really are just going to working with voice, just a really quick and easy way to work with voice is the idea. Yeah, gotcha. I, I, I definitely had some of the some of the same observations that Austin had. Uh, first, like as a voice actor, noise floor for me is for me is everything, and I, you know, I got to get mine down as low as I can. So that's actually my typical first pass because I'm an Isotope user also, and I typically will do just what she suggested and apply voice de noise mm -hmm. first. My my preference for Isotope is I try and give it the cleanest signal so before i mess around with anything else the first thing i do is is a voice denoise and i find it it's a little bit of black magic because you you really yeah. can really dial in that noise floor just right and that's critical a lot of people don't understand that this the the, the chain of where you go first and second mm -hmm. and third and fourth does matter and if you if you take something like you start compressing it that noise floor is going to start fluctuating Bouncing with around. it so yeah. you start with the noise start with the background right. noise and what you're planning on doing you could tweak it later if you need to but that noise level is critical for, for a starting point, at least in my opinion. Yeah. And with voice denoise, I, I definitely would suggest doing at like start low, start instead of hitting it all at once. I prefer to hit it kind of in smaller amounts if I need to push it a little further than I can. But, you know, I, I feel like I get a smoother result that way. Now, personally. correct me if I'm wrong, but you, you work for Nickelodeon. So you probably also are used to sound effects and music and, and background also. Would that change at all since he's just doing voice by itself? Would you, would, if you were just going to be doing voice without all those elements behind it, would that change your, your thoughts and opinions or um, what your process would be? Currently at Nickelodeon, um, I actually pretty much work with exactly what he's working with. Um, right we just do voice. Um, we actually, voice is the very first thing that gets done in animation. Yeah. Um, so uh, pretty much exactly what he's doing is what I work with. Um, day in and day out. So, yeah. 
Great. Good. Um, Austin, we're getting some feedback. Could you could you mm-hmm. bump your levels up just a touch here? All the, the guys are getting uh, pretty excited, and um, <laughs> we're, we're going to bring your, your levels up to, to match here. Is that a bit better? A bit? I think that I think so. Yeah, I think so. Cool. Um, I, had, I had one other observation for Peter, and I'm not sure if anybody else picked up for it. But one of the things I think about as someone who does a lot of long form is mm-hmm. diction and clarity. If you're going to be listening to something for 20 minutes, an hour, multiple hours, if an if an audio book, and that's sort of what this story was, is I find that almost always when a when it's especially a male voice, and you're working really close to a mic, especially those dynamic microphones, that they do usually benefit from a little demudding. And I thought Peter could use a little bit of a of a demudder, like a couple of dB to 200, 250 hertz, taking that out just a little bit. When I was doing my testing on on his raw audio, I found all of a sudden it became just so much clearer and easier to understand. And it's, Mm -hmm. it's a subtle thing that you don't notice right away at first. But when you're listening for a long period of time, it, I find it to be a lot less fatiguing if you take just a couple of dB away in that that low mid low mid range high high base area. Yeah, that that band of frequencies is, is such a, a delicate place to play because a few dB is too high and it becomes like a, li- a few dB is too high becomes muddy and uh, but if you get it just right it gives a brilliant warmth to it. Yeah. You know, it's it's a very difficult place to play but worth it. Yeah, yeah. Now let me let me ask something real quick, Curtis. Do you have his raw audio, the the unprocessed that he sent to us? I do. Yeah. Can, do you want to hear you, that? Can you play that also, so so we can get an idea of his starting point? Yep. Here you go. Marching to your own beat. The class was unsettled on this spring. Full screen. And the teacher was not confident the subject would capture their imaginations. She bravely plunged into a description of trailer bites. Young Curtis, though, he did not have to pay attention, as he could listen later to his Zoom. Up. Looking wistfully at the playing field and dreaming of her band winning. Um, the biggest note that I had on, on all of his, in his recording process is that his voice is not loud. It's not extremely dynamic. And he recorded extremely low. Mm -hmm. So that was the big note that I had at first. I thought it was probably 32 bit floating point. And he was going to, he was going to try to rely on that to, to bring him up to where he wanted to be, but it's just recorded very low for 24, for for 24 bit, in my opinion. So Mm -hmm. he could definitely bring that up quite a bit and it would probably give him a better, a better signal to noise ratio by the time he gets into post. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It was peaking. Uh, I think the true peak was minus 20, minus 22, something yeah, like yeah, that. Yeah. It was so like, it was way a lot low. of headroom. That's yeah. a lot of headroom. That's for sure. Yeah. For sure. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. That was Very the big good. note that I had. Okay. Okay. Well, uh, Peter, thank you so much. Uh, anything else before we wrap up and move on to the next one? No? Good. No, okay. Peter, thank you. Yeah, yeah, Peter, solid, thank you solid. so much. Yes, we're going to, um, uh, by the way, uh, we very kindly, I, um, Waves, the, the company that makes the plugins, has actually offered to uh, provide a Clarity VX plugin, which is their brand new artificial intelligence denoiser. Oh, it's cool. So, it's wow. very yeah, cool. it's incredible. And so, cool. uh, you'll be able to add that, Peter, to your collection along with all the Isotope RX. Um, so, you got two Perfect. options. Beautiful addition. <laughs> Perfect. All right. Let's go to our next one. This is from Mr. Ted Leroy. And I'm going to, let me just go ahead and go first to the document. Um, Ted had details. Incredible detail, Ted. Yes. That is amazing. Um, Let me just kind of cut over to this really quickly. The diagrams were Mm -hmm. insane. Insane. So, love the detail. Love the detail. So Ted is uh, is essentially trying to record and do all the processing in the signal chain on the way in. So uh, that's that's Ted's main goal is he's trying to get there without having to do a bunch of post. Um, he is using an a Universal Audio Apollo interface and so has a bunch of virtual plugins uh, processors that are running there. Um, I don't know that we're going to tie. We're going to necessarily <laughs> dig into all of the detail here, but this is super helpful for our panelists to get a look at what we we're doing. It was wonderful front. to get to dig into and dissect. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I was looking at the like here. Here's a little 
a little EQ. The LA-2A, just really mild, uh, mm -hmm. pretty mild, I would say, there on the the compression, got a de -esser. In any case, let's jump on over to the sample here so you can hear what that sounds like. And oh, one little thing here, Ted, you did leave a long tail there. We're just gonna go ahead and cut that off <laughs> and let's go ahead and play this back. Curtis, esteemed panelists and fellow soundies, thank you for taking the time Did we lose Is it cut out for anybody else? We lost Okay, audio. so it wasn't just me. Okay, yeah, we, we, we lost it there. Curtis, we lost your audio. <laughs> he doesn't know that. Just yet. imagine Curtis. it. Just, just play it in the theater of your mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's, that's the thing. I'm going to try to say something at the same time as his wave, so that way we can... Try to get an idea of the way <laughs> my physical signal chain is, is pretty straightforward playing? now it is there we go my electro voice re20 mic plugs into a grace design m101 preamp then into my uad apollo twin duo thunderbolt digital audio curtis uh, is there so, any way we could we could jump back so we can yeah. hear the, the top and, of it and ted you apologize that wasn't you that was a technical difficulty that was uh, that, was, uh, that wasn't that was, your yours that was Curtis uh, attempting to mix with two different mixers in the signal chain. By the way, not recommended um, because you can, you know, try to take a drink. Anyway, we're going to go ahead and play through again. Here we go. Curtis, esteemed panelists and fellow soundies, thank you for taking the time to provide your expertise and possibly reviewing my audio clip. I record dialogue to narrate my online video courses. I would like my workflow to be efficient, ideally with no post-processing required for my audio. I hope I've achieved this with the following hardware and software signal chain and settings, but I'd very much like to hear any critique you can offer and improvements I can try to make to make it sound better. I would like my audio to sound rich, professional and interesting, but not distracting. The students should be focused on the content, but I do want it to sound good. My physical signal chain is pretty straightforward. My Electrovoice RE20 mic plugs into a Grace Design M101 preamp, then into my UAD Apollo Twin Duo Thunderbolt digital audio. There we go. Okay, there okay. we go. There we go. All right, Mike, do you wanna you wanna lead us through this one? Sure, sure. I'll I'll talk about certainly my impressions. So the first thing that my impression uh, of it is one it's great from a from a teaching perspective especially if you're going to be doing something like live streaming i'm not sure if those classes are, are going to be live but being able to do it sort of all of your processing without having to do a lot of post especially in a live streaming as, as curtis and others can attest it's the, that can be a little bit complicated because you don't get a chance to, to 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 try it twice that that being said i i did get the sense that one that didn't sound like an re20 anymore so there's a lot, to my impression, mm -hmm. there's a lot of stuff that's happening along the way in this chain. So if I understood mm -hmm. it correctly, we go from the RE20 to a Grace preamp to the Apollo to an SSL channel strip that's compressing and EQing. And then we go into a Neve that's EQing. And then we go into an LA2A that's compressing. Then we go into a DSer. Then we go into Hindenburg that's also got a noise reducer and an EQ. Mm-hmm. That's a that's a pretty complicated and there's a number of output adjustments, uh, output gain adjustments yeah. along the way. Yes. And my my <laughs> my question <laughs> go back to that last screen. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> After on top of adding, I'm sorry, I'm just gonna hop in there real quick. After adding so much EQ in various different stages, that is the thing that we ended with the last bit. Good a Lord. humongous boost. It's, it's a pretty aggressive, it's a pretty aggressive EQ curve. It's too mm -hmm. blurry to know the scale. So if that's a yeah. one dB scale or a 10 dB scale, um, it's a pretty it, assuming it's a 10 dB scale, it's a pretty aggressive like it, yeah. EQ curve at the end. Mm -hmm. So my question for Ted and, and my advice when we're thinking about these things is that if you're going to add all of those things to your chain, do so with intention. Don't just, mm -hmm. and I'm not saying that this is what Ted did, but don't add a Neve equalizer because people say you got to have a Neve or an LA-2A because you got to have an LA-2A or whatever it is. Know what you're doing. So start with the RE20 into the Apollo with nothing and identify, okay, what what's bad about that? 
What don't I like about that? Is there noise floor I need to address? Then I might add the noise suppressor. Is there a boominess? Then I'll add a, a, a little bit of an EQ to take that little bit of boominess away. Is there, am I lacking a high end sparkle because it's a dynamic? So I need to add a little EQ there. But I think that this signal chain is getting a, a lot of modification to it. And by the time it's making it to Hindenburg, I think I think that signal is acting in in unpredictable ways. It's hard to know exactly what's going to happen uh, yeah. by the time it gets there. So I'd suggest simplifying it because I don't know that all those things are making that mic sound as good as that mic can sound. It sounded to me a little hollow, um, the, you know, by the time it got to the end. And I think that there are some settings that probably do make it sound a little bit more more process than it needs to. So that's my, my first bit is, is if you're going to add something to your signal chain, if you're going to, if you're going to modify it, do so with intention and know what the goal is by adding that thing to it. Absolutely. I mean, that's the hardware, the grace, the grace preamp, grace preamp is no joke, but do you need that over the Apollo? Because I think that SSL plugin is designed because it's in the unison slot is designed to modify the, the Apollo's preamp and I don't know what it's doing if you have a grace preamp in front of that. I, all of a sudden, I don't know what's happening. Yeah. And uh, I think there just needs to be a bit more in, in, intention Yeah, is my, is my thought. If you don't mind, I'm going to throw in something there too. Anything you do to the signal adds a little bit of warping and distortion. Because you're basically yeah. taking something that was recorded naturally through a microphone that was engineered to more or less sound natural – and then you start messing with it and manipulating it and changing this and that and this and that. All of that adds a little bit of distortion. All of that adds a little bit of, of it, it, it starts to take away from what you're really you know, going for there. And you spend a lot of money here on a lot of very good you know, equipment here and, and plugins and everything. Trying to, to streamline your process is one of the things you said is that you really want to make it so that way you don't have to do any post-processing. So what you need to think about then is what can you do to eliminate a process? Because if you're trying to keep it simple, which is something that you need to do if you don't want to do a lot of processing, if you want to do it and keep it simple, you got to eliminate things that are going to be something you have to process out. For example, there's a lot of, of mouth pops and clicks and stuff like mm -hmm. that. If, either, if there's that, then what you need to do is not get so close to the microphone. You need to back off a little bit so those things don't are not there as much. And by doing that, then you can boost it back up. Now, there was... There is, there's, it's it, the best analogy I can come up with to kind of, you know, give you an idea of what's going on here is you want to make a cake and you say, oh, I want this cake to be great. And I want it to be, you know, just, just to sound, to, to taste very, very simple. So I'm going to add chocolate chips, butterscotch. I'm going to add whipped cream. I'm going to add a lot of sugar. I'm going to add, and you start throwing stuff in there, just trying to make it better. You add too much to it and it's going to be like, what are you making here? And that's kind of the impression by the time it got to the end of the way it felt to me. I don't have a starting point because you didn't send that. But to me, it was compressed extremely like to a, st a straight line on top. Mm -hmm. And when that happened, there's no dynamics. And yeah. every with everything being that flat, it really starts to drive home the point of the processing, everything you do on the inside uh, of on the inside of those wave, waves. So when you look at it, you can really see that there was a, a lot of aggressive limiting and compression. When you clip and when you get in and zoom in, you see a lot in flattened off peaks, clipping, which, yeah. which tells yeah. me that that's a lot of very aggressive processing. So the thing I would tell you is to simplify your process. Start off at the very beginning again. Start off with just the Apollo and your mic and see what is lacking like what Mike said. Yeah. If you start there and you say, well, geez, I, I'm getting too many mouth pops. Back off on your microphone a little bit to try to to fix that in the real world so you don't have to rely on a plug-in if you then increase your gain does that start to bring in too much of the real world that you don't like if so you might have to run a process on that but mm -hmm. if you start to dial in on every little bitty thing and el every element what is it lacking what would actually be necessary to fix that in the real world as opposed to a process and then you're probably going to be easier now another thing you can do and start to just continue to blab is if you create a signal flow a signal chain because a lot of the things I do on sound speeds, once I dial in on my noise, I go click, 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 click. I do it the same way every, every single time because I record in that environment the same way every single time. So having something that is just a, a streamlined process that you know would, would take a lot of the, the guesswork and processing out of, uh, uh, of uh, and time out of it might also be beneficial to you. 
And you brought up the mouth clicks. Um, obviously, I'm biased as a dialogue editor. I'm always going to encourage <laughs> to kind of, yes, do a little bit of post-processing, but it doesn't have to be very intense. It definitely needs a pass of a mouth de-click or a de-clicker. Um, whether you want to, again, zoom in on a spectrogram and kind of find those clicks yourself, um, I'll leave that up to you. Um, however, I would be very careful when removing those clicks. Um, because something that might sound like a click or a pop in isolation, just on a spectrogram, that might be you hitting a consonant. I, I, I notice you hit your K, your like K's and your T, like the way you hit consonants was very sharp and that's not a bad thing. Just be careful whenever you're going through and if you wanna remove those mouth clicks, make sure you're not taking out any of your voice, any of you hitting those consonants because then your intelligibility can be muddled. Um, yeah. Um, I other thing to add, and I, I see that um, Shoji Produ Productions had a question here that says, "Have we ever been able to record VOR dialogue that works well with a minimum amount of processing?" And I think that that's probably germane to this part of the discussion because so much of it, as as everybody here can attest, is ninety percent of your recording sound is your room, the room mm -hmm. that you're recording it in. Like you can hear a difference between my sound and Austin's sound right? Because we're in differently shaped rooms. We've got really different amounts of acoustic treatment. Mine is that mine is practically a studio and yours is a room and it, they sound different. Yeah. Right? Mine's it, a room it, with a nine-year-old dog snoring in the corner. I apologize right, in right. advance if you could hear her in the background. There's no controlling it. Right. And her room sounds appreciably different than mine, which is, I, this is acoustically true. I've got acoustic treatment on practically every surface of this room and we, we sound different. And so much of what I think people try to overcome with software, EQ curves, D reverb and all that stuff is really trying to overcome something in the room. And so much of your recordings can be fixed by thinking about the environment mm -hmm. before the electronics. I also see a note here that says that his chain is baked in when he records. So if he has this as the signal chain and then he's doing all these VSTs on the fly, mm -hmm. that's something you might consider getting, uh, you know, you don't have to do that unless you're going live and that's the sound you're going for. Yeah. You can very easily record straight out of your microphone, straight into your preamp, straight into whatever your recorder is mm -hmm. um, and, and eliminate that signal, uh, the signal chain and, and give it simple, get it simple, kiss, keep it simple, stupid. Mm -hmm. You know, keep it simple and you can go back and reprocess and change things up in post later mm -hmm. and establish the, the workflow that you want to establish. But you don't have to record with this entire signal chain. And I would strongly recommend doing so uh, or recommend against doing so. Yeah. And even yeah. if you are doing a live like type of thing, still stripping back, I think would oh, yeah. probably greatly affect yeah. quality. Yeah. Yep. We are um, we're going to be looking for a dog snore filter uh that's the next thing that i'm going to we're ask waves we're we're snore. <laughs> yeah <laughs> Iso snore. isotope 10 is going to be d snore <laughs> it's going to be for the people doing sleep streams waves I'm might waiting. beat them to it i'm not sure <laughs> so in any case ted uh thank you so much for um for submitting this this is a, i think a great illustration and a great uh, uh opportunity for us to kind of talk through approaches here um also we're also trying to create a safe space, so we're not. This is not criticizing anyone, saying no, no. what you did is wrong. I, I, this no. is. Um, I, I I'm actually a little envious of some of your gear, by the way. Yeah, yeah. And I, I definitely yeah. feel like I remember. You know, I'm I only graduated from college in 2020, and I remember first diving into the world of building my setup, and it's so intimidating because there are so many great products out there, and so many highly mm -hmm. revered and highly reviewed ones that it's almost like you get this sense of like, oh, if I don't have all these things, then am I really a sound professional? Am I really doing these things correctly? And it's it's kind of about stepping back, re realizing, okay, I don't need all these things. We're gonna just figure this out one step at a time, you know? Uh, one other note that I'm gonna say, since a lot of us have channels here, we do talk about review and, and show things that we use or we're sent to review, that kind of thing. There's a lot of, of, oh, cool, this is a really cool thing that does this. This is a really cool thing that does that. Keep in mind, though, there's a lot of really cool things out there, Definitely. just like Austin just said. And so you don't need to get them all and use them all. <laughs> just and as a matter of fact, you shouldn't. You. So, yeah. so 
so even though you may see a video that says this is a really cool thing, this is the newest, hottest thing, you may have some old school gear or last week's plugin that was the top of the line, and that's still working great for everything you need to. A lot of the things that a lot of uh, that that plugins do is for people like Austin trying to stay at the the cutting edge of making things sound great in post. Mm-hmm. For a podcast, for your for your voice recordings and stuff like that, you don't get into that. How often do you go into all those advanced features in Photoshop? You might use the same like five or ten features over and over again. You don't need all 10,000 features Photoshop has. Same thing with a lot of the plugins. It may be nice to say that you use the newest thing as part of your single chain. You don't have to do that, though. You shouldn't do that if it means spending so much money and what you're trying to do is simplify your signal flow so you don't have to do as much processing. Yeah, and the other the other thing I just as a as a as a thought f- for Ted, uh, I just was going back and looking through the comments. He says that that is baked in. Bear in mind that if you're baking all that stuff into your recording, that's destructive. It's yes. it's not undoable, and that's one of the reasons that we're we're suggesting is is putting that recording onto disc and then do those um, do that signal chain. Chances are you can bake that signal chain into whatever. Hindenburg or Pro Tools or Reaper or whatever, DA to Fairlight, whatever you're doing, you can bake a lot of that stuff in and then process it. But it gives you a chance to undo if something doesn't yeah. sound right. And I will always advocate <laughs> for having uh, what I like to call an X track, wherein basically leave a copy of the unprocessed file available, <laughs> muted in a track, so that if you go through that processing and you're like, I don't love how this is sounding. You can always pull a copy of that of that completely unfiltered raw audio and you can start sure. again. Smart. Or you can you can A B it and say, and yeah. say am I am I making this better or am I making this worse at this point? Yeah. <laughs> with, let's go back and listen. Yeah. Pretty oh. much the whole job, really. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, with with the with the ones that we received, the people who had the raw and the processed, I definitely A B'd. Just you know, I synced yeah. them up. Mm-hmm. I A B back and forth just so I could Same get a thing. sense of what's yep. happening. Yeah. Yeah. And also, and, I did a I did a subtraction test on on the two to see what was actually what what was the difference in what was processed and what was not processed. And you can also hear hear. Yeah some stuff that way yeah Yeah. interesting okay we have one more oh by the way so clarity vx plugin for you as well ted i'll be in touch um so we'll get that over to you use that one sparingly as well um but and and all of these oh one second that plugin i was recommended so one of my viewers uh, recommended i get that and i have a a uh as soon as i do my part of it i'm sorry jake sloan i'm going to be doing a collaboration with jake sloan with mm-hmm. regards to drones, and that plugin comes into play very strongly. Oh. So there's a little tidbit and, and a, a little bit of a, of a uh, teaser for something in the future. It's really cool Smart. what you can do with that plugin. Smart. I have yeah. to imagine that there's a ton of audio recorded nowadays for films with drones. Uh, yeah, yeah. What is it that like? Mm-hmm. I can't make the noise, but it scares the, when I don't know what's. I had one fly over me once and I wasn't expecting it, and I just about jumped out of my skin. I thought, ah, I'm getting attacked by. <laughs> black or red, yellow jackets or whatever you know yeah. freaked out anyway okay we're going to go on to the third one this is a submission from mike harper and uh let me just go ahead and switch over here we'll take a look mike gave us incredible detail as well we even have the gps yeah. coordinates yeah. here um <laughs> and i did look those up it is in the middle of of a of nowhere <laughs> it is it is pretty awesome location for background yep. noise Yep, and then uh, record into a Tascam DR60D with a DDS mic 2S, so the short shotgun mic, 24-bit recording, and then on the post-processing, it looks like uh, Mike went into uh, Fairlight in DaVinci Resolve and added a limiter, a vocal channel, a de-esser, normalized the audio, and then did some edits with crossfades. So that's where we're starting from. Let's go ahead and... This is the before, so we'll go ahead and play both of them, at least a sample. We'll play a little bit of the before, and then I'll jump over to the processed version. So think about the ecological site key this way. It's going to start with the things that will most inhibit. Okay, and then here is processed. Oh, nope, that's the wrong one. So think about the ecological site key this way it's gonna start with the things that will most inhibit plant production right off the bat in every category we've seen the first question here is is it saline or not is it a sodic soil so what that's telling us 
is that that's our first major break. That's the first major thing to look out for. When we're digging our pit, when we're looking at our plants, you know, have it in the back of your mind. Is this saline or not? Because that's going to be our first major limiting factor on the vegetation production on this site. Okay. Alan, you want to lead us off on this one? Sure. I'm going to, I took a lot of notes because it excited me that he was on location, but uh, I'm going <laughs> to, I'm going to not overwhelm you. The shooting location that he was shooting in gave him a negative 71 dB noise floor, which was great. Mm -hmm. um, uh, he, he took great notes, but there was a couple of things. I mean, he even talked about his relative humidity, his exact location, the time of day, GPS coordinates, all those kind of things. But one thing that he did not tell us, he says the microphone was boomed. He didn't tell us if his overhead boomed, below boomed. I don't know if this mm -hmm. is part of a video he was doing or if this was just a voiceover that was going to accomplish B-roll. But what I did notice is that I heard some nasal stuff. I heard some a lot, a lot of the uh, breath in. Um, it, it really sounded to me like a microphone was on, underneath. And at the same time, he's using a DDS mic too. And he made a comment that it had the furry on it, but he was still using 120 hertz roll off. That's extremely aggressive and it cuts into the vocal frequencies quite a bit, which is a reason why he sounded very, he didn't have much bass in his voice. Now, if he's using a short shotgun microphone like the, the S Mic 2S, that's small. And if you put a furry on the end of that, one of two things is going to happen. If it's not the right length, it's going to start to press in on the shock mount. Perhaps it's going to cause noise there. Or if it's not long enough, it's not going to cover enough of the interference too because that's, it's so short trying to fit into a, um, a shock mount. So what he might have run into, because I was hearing it about 41 seconds in, I heard some wind hitting that mic. So it may not have been covering up all the vents on the side of the, uh, the microphone. And I would actually question whether or not it was or wasn't. But the 120 hertz roll off, get rid of that, because I think even in post, he, added, he said he added another one, if memory serves. 60 hertz roll off added in post. And then he started to, um, to mess with the, the EQ, I guess. But um, looks the like big the thing I would Alan, that you were right. I think he says, if that's the mic I'm thinking of, it says in the comments, it's, it, it's under boomed. Oh, I don't remember it saying under boomed. No, no. I, uh, I think he boomed from under. Okay. In the comments, I think it's. He, okay. In his document, he, it didn't he, specify over right. or under, but right. when it was coming yeah, he, from underneath. He, yeah. When it was coming from underneath, I heard a lot of no's. Mm -hmm. um, and that's, and that's something that you do catch when you're doing under. Now, I don't know if this was a video that he was shooting at the same time and it was being under boom for, you know, whatever purposes. But if you under boom, one of the things you have to be careful of is the no, the no, nose and breathing. Cause you will hear that. So there's not a D nose plugin that I'm familiar with. Maybe Austin would know about that, Again, but working um, on it, working on it. <laughs> that, that the D snore is going to be part of our, uh, the next RX, I guess. Um, <laughs> But the biggest thing that I would say is when you're booming from underneath, be aware of things like noses uh, and breathing and, and that kind of thing. Because the, the, the angle uh, wasn't really working against you except for the fact that I was he able to hear the nose. And because you put that 120 hertz filter on that, it just – it knocked down so much of your fundamentals. And I understand if you're coming up from underneath, you might want to try to get rid of some of that bass. It's better to do in post later. Um, and then um, – there was also a note that I had very interestingly. Well, actually, you know what? I'll, I'll come back to that and talk about processing here in a moment. Uh, anybody else have something you want to add? Alan, I, I had a quick question just from the from the boom position. We, we do hear, and I'm guilty of this all the time, an audible swallow. Like you hear that sort, sort of a gulp. If if the boom is up here versus down here, does it, is there an appreciable difference? Because we all swallow and some of it, it makes noise. Does it make a does it make a difference? It does it actually kind of aimed more towards the throat. It, yeah. it, it does actually. There's just like if you have a lav right here and it is buried too high, it's th it sounds throaty, and then you're off axis to the mouth. So it's called chin shadow right here. Mm -hmm. uh, a boom microphone that's coming up from underneath, it's going to get what first? The chest. Next thing it's going to get is the mouth, is the is the neck on. Uh, on axis or trying to get the mouth. If you're coming from overhead first, the chin actually will block the neck a little bit. So depending on your angle, you can, you can actually cut out some of that. Also, if you watch some of my videos, you know that I cue off of your head, depending on like how you're sitting. If you're sitting at a table, for example, you cue off the table a little bit to try to, to, to fill up the pattern more with this and less of the neck and chest, because it's going to all be there anyway. But you're exactly right that the farthest thing away is going to fall off the, 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 the best and the things that are closest are going to be picked up the most. Mm. That four second in gulp that he, he gave, I had to start taking off my headphones because it was when he processed it, it literally was making me cringe. And, and I, I, I was starting to get triggered and I didn't want that to happen. So every single, every single time I was replaying it, I would do this 
and then back on because I could not stand hearing that. And after whoa, a while, whoa, whoa, then I whoa, said, whoa. you know what I could do is I could actually <laughs> time bring out, it down time and back out. up. Time, time I out. could bring it down and back up. Alan, so I, Alan I, I can kill that part of the signal. Can you show us that technique again where you take your headphones <laughs> off and back on? This is well, the, that was only, a, only a boom operator can do that. Go ahead, do that again, <laughs> would you? Going like this and then right back on. Wow. <laughs> the speed. The speed. Well, the speed right you want to know, you right know what I end up doing a lot if I'm holding the pole is I do that to yeah. listen to something on the yep. outside world. Yep. So that. that's a real quick, you know, shoulder move that you got to get used to also. Do that on the same on both sides. I try and do that. How the headphones are in my lap. How train that? <laughs> <laughs> like, seriously, that's a skill. You that's, should. That's, it's, it's another day in the life of a boom operator. You should see him uh, wrap a cable too. Oh my goodness. Incredible. It's a different... Yeah, I, anyway. I'm not even going to try to embarrass myself by attempting that. It's... <laughs> uh, um, Austin, you were going to say something? Uh, yeah, just uh, I noticed that in the document you, know, you discussed uh, cutting out the breaths, uh, which I appreciate. That's something we touched on with uh, Peter's stuff. I know removing breaths manually. I know. I do it day in and day out. It is annoying. Um, I, I noticed I could hear in the way that you used crossfades, I could tell you used an equal gain crossfade because you could hear the noise floor dip in and then come back up. Yes. Um, I would suggest when cutting out breaths, instead of using equal gain, use equal power because you won't lose the volume power across it. So you won't get that dip. Um, but if uh, it's a thing where you remove a breath and you're like, I don't really love like the cadence. Now my words seem too close together. Um, always, always, always cut a bit of room tone, cut a bit of room tone, stitch it together. That is going to be something that smooths everything out. Um, again, tedious work, very worth it. And still also recommend using um, equal power fades on that as opposed to equal gain. Just to again, maintain that smooth feeling across the whole thing should feel seamless. That's actually an interesting note that I hadn't even gotten into when I, when I, I had my, uh, my list of processing notes here and you pretty much nailed them. The only thing I would add, and uh, and, the, and you started to go there, is that with your background noise, the, some of the processing that you did started changing your background noise level quite a bit. Mm -hmm. And to Austin's point here, if you if you set up Isotope in such a way where it's not doing those very aggressive fades that completely go to uh, go out, it actually muted the tracks in places. Um, one of the things I would say is you probably don't need to mess with that nearly as much if you also record, like Austin said, a thirty second room tone, but then listen to this or, or world tone in this case, but listen to this. If you start off your processing and you knock out because it's not, it's very low in the background. You yeah. knock out that background noise altogether. No more background noise. Then at the end, you can bring it up. You can add the background noise level to where you wanted to. It's the same thing as what dithering does by adding a little bit of noise in the background. So that way you don't hear as much of the, the, the digital artifacts, same kind of thing. When you just knock out the background noise and you start processing, then you're like, oh, yikes, I hear some of that. Mm -hmm. But as soon as you add just back in on top of the noise floor, just just to, just a, a very low noise, you could bring it up to the level that suits your ears. You'll find that a lot of your processing will just sit on top of that. A lot of those little artifacts and stuff are going to sit in the noise floor, and you're not going to notice it because it's all very low in the background. Yep, it gives you an extra layer of control, more more puzzle pieces to fit together. To exactly and you don't even need like to go. It fading in and out like they do in post you could just yeah. you know put it down there and Blank then re it. you know and then just have it there do all your yeah. processing you know do an experiment with that i bet you you'll find that that will work for you especially if you shoot in very quiet locations like that mm -hmm. um there was a, a question in his document about he's he noted that he's got some sibilance in his voice his, his s's whistle a, a little bit and how to find them i know that i've when i go and do dsing and stuff in that uh, something like that in my tool in reaper i can actually in the spectrogram and probably isotope would do this too you can actually Definitely. highlight those you can highlight those frequencies in a spectrogram and usually see really precisely what frequency your s or different s sounds are sitting and actually i, I found a couple of different s sounds like 5500 and 6500 for, your, for uh -huh. yours yeah. to my to my recollection that's where yours are but i encourage you if you're if you're unfamiliar with a spectrogram start to get to know the spectrogram because that can really just with surgical precision show you exactly where those are so if you need to configure a deesser to ds if you want to uh, a multiband compressor to compress out those those s sounds or however you want to adjust it the the spectrogram reveals all and it will tell you exactly yeah it will it will really show you where those s sounds are 
And yeah, you can have multiple S's. You absolutely, right? Different S's, different pronunciations, whether it's C or S or SH or T. I mean, we have lots of different different sounds. Uh, but the spectrogram, they're like, they're just like red lights. You, you can just see exactly where they are. Mm -hmm. And I will always advocate if you're working in isotope, it will always default to just the orange and blue um, color scheme. I always advocate for changing it to rainbow. Uh, one, more fun to look at, but two, you get a lot more differentiation in, um, in because there's more colors involved, it's a lot easier to pick out things. Um, more things stand out. So especially if you are just starting to become familiar with spectrograms in isotope, uh, specifically put in as many colors as possible. Just makes things pop to the eye a lot if, easier. If Curtis could bring up his isotope for a second, can you can you sh tell, show him how to do that or where to do that? I, I have isotope and I haven't done, I haven't turned it into uh, the Skittles, you know, <laughs> look, but um, I would love to see Curtis's go all haywire in colors. Mm -hmm. Give me Do you just have your set a to second, orange, Curtis. Uh, I have the default settings. I have to confess. Um, so this is where I get schooled by my friend Austin. I appreciate That's okay. this. I'm going to be. I'm going to be taking <laughs> notes as well. Uh, let me pull up Mike's um, here, and we'll go ahead. And I'm going to pop over. So I'm going to make it full screen here. And Austin, if you want to talk me through how to do this. I believe. Uh, so we're going to go to um, spectra. I think go to display. It was down there. Oh, yeah, it was down there. Oh, like sorry. References, display. Second tab. Display, okay. Yeah, let me see. Oh, wait, no. Where we're actually going to go, um, we're going to look for the spectrogram preferences. Um, so what you're going to do is... Um, is it view spectrogram settings? Yes, I believe so. Oh. This is always where yeah. This is always where Oh, there, there it there is. There it is, spectrogram settings. And then you are going to go to color map. Cyan right now it's set orange. to cyan to orange. Oh. And then go down to multicolor number one. Look oh. how much Ooh. more pops out at you. Look at that. Oh my. Look at that. Look how much easier it is to see where sound is densest. Um, it's now no longer which area <laughs> is more orange than another. It's now, oh, purple versus red. Um, so that's That's, that's aggressive. That, I like it. <laughs> it's, it's something I always recommend right off the top. This reminds me of that Grateful Dead show I went to in 1987. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Just something instructive here. You can clearly see the cuts the, yes. and the, mm -hmm. the fades there. You can see yeah. that they Actually, just play a couple of those if you would. Yeah. Um I don't know if I have this set up. Yeah, to it's play. just right there. You can just play it off the screen, can't you? Or, oh, oh, oh. It it's might a, run off a different um audio engine. Yeah, it's yeah, a, it is. Core audio. Let's change it to external headphones. This might work. This Fingers might not. Crossed. No. Alas. Alas, no. Sorry about that. I'm not set up for that. But you, you can clearly totally see okay. how it faded out. You can yeah. see you see you the fades yeah. between the big spot. chunks. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it would look a lot if you if you were to, to, to take that noise floor, completely knock it out, and then add the room uh, the world tone to it. Mm -hmm. You would see that it would it would be more just the colors where the voice is, and then it would fall down to a lot lighter colors. Mm -hmm. You know elsewhere yeah. good stuff um i did we did get a question here as well that i'd love to bring up i think here from mark um talking about manually fading breaths um should a slight bit of breath between sentences be left or cut completely austin i would love to hear what you have to say about that i think that totally depends on the context in which you are recording for you know, um, in animation a lot of times as i'm going through and cutting out breaths i have to look to see if is that breath animated or not, you know? And if not, mm. we cut it, but it completely depends. If you're doing uh, an audiobook situation or a podcast, you know, like maybe it just totally depends on your preference and what what it is. In, in my experience from the, uh, from the audiobook world is typically an inhale before a sentence, you would, I would typically leave it. The only time the breaths that I cut because they mess with cadence is if you have like, if you run out of breath mid sentence, mm -hmm. typically you just retake that sentence and fix it. Yeah. But if you don't, a lot of times, if you're doing those micro breaths, you'll cut those. But what I, I typically do, and maybe other people do this too, is, is I use um, uh, an expander. Mm -hmm. And so I have it configured that whenever my, whatever the threshold of my breath is, that gets expanded downward. So it, mm -hmm. it really minimizes how loud it is, mm -hmm. but it doesn't, 
mess with the cadence because sometimes if you start cutting breaths out especially for long form narration definitely the cadence gets too fast and it gets yeah. hectic and all of a sudden you're you're speeding through things because yeah. we talk we talk and we naturally breathe so i like to leave the spaces where they occur but you don't want it to be like <sighs> yeah. you know you don't want it to and be in there the whole time so we just we just expand it down yeah and that's one of so the it's reasons it's still there that's cool yeah, and that's one of the reasons why um, I always advocate for having that room tone for like, if you do want to cut out that breath, but you want to leave the space, space. you want to make sure you have something that stitches th those two parts together and make it s it sound just seamless and smooth. Yep. Also in RX, you can dial in on a small little area. If you don't get a, a world tone or a room tone, you can dial in on a small little area of, of noise and create as much as you want to, which is really cool. Ambience match, my beloved. Yes. <laughs> 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 well, Mike, thank you so much for submitting your audio sample as well. You'll, I'll, I'll be in touch with you as well to get that uh, copy of Clarity VX over to you. Now, we had, I said before three, we actually had four submissions. There's one special submission that unfortunately we won't be able to use in the Dialogue Edit Mixmaster Challenge, but I thought I should play it for you anyway. Um, let me just go ahead and cut on over to this and show you what we've got here. This was submitted by somebody who goes by the name of Bandrew Scott. Um, Bandrew submitted an MP3. It was supposed to be a wave, uh -huh. but I definitely wanted to go ahead. <laughs> also, and play if you notice the 32 bit floating point down at the bottom, I'm sure you did that for me. <laughs> and he recorded it in stereo. Nothing yeah. like recording your, your voice in two channel no. stereo, 32 bit floating point, and then putting it on MP3. Brilliant. <laughs> And let's uh, let's go ahead and play through just so that we have some context here. Here we go. Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! Oh my gosh! This is being listened to by Curtis Judd, the Curtis Judd. Learn light and sound? Are you kidding me? How is anybody as fortunate as me? What? How how can I have you listening to this is so exciting. I have been waiting for this moment, Curtis Judd. Yes. Yes, Curtis Judd. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to be presented in front of you and not only you, not only you, Curtis Judd, you gave me the opportunity to be in front of the booth junkie, Mike Delgadio. Thank you so much. Oh God, I can't handle it. Oh, this is so. It sound speeds. Sound speeds. Can he say it for us, please? Not for you. Sound speeds, please. And then Austin. Oh my goodness gracious. I am so honored to be in front of this esteemed panel. What can I even say to? Oh my. A plus. So what's None interesting is that he, he did follow the one rule. He did. He submitted no more than 60 seconds. It cut off mid-sentence. Um, so, Andrew, thank you for that. Um, and thank you for um, thank you for that submission. No notes. <laughs> oh, I, I don't know about y'all, but but considering who this was and what he was doing, I got very critical. So, Alan. So I, I took some good notes. If we want to just. Go, ahead. go through it. Go right ahead. Oh, ahead. really? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, well, first of all, he didn't follow instructions about listing his signal flow, either his his VSTs or or his uh, his his actual signal flow, um, and so he didn't follow directions. I guess he's above us. Uh, I would also <laughs> like to mention that when we're talking about banjo, it's best that he normalize all of his audio to negative one hundred and twenty lux. That's going to be much better for all of us. And of course, you know, the 32 bit floating point was great. So, of course, uh, you know, since he records his MP3s in that, throwing it down there, he could always get it back if he wants to hear his own voice. Uh, the best thing about it is that he kept it to just under a minute, which was wonderful. Now, what I will say is that while his voice does sound full, he should back off on the mic a little bit so he doesn't hit it with the occasional plosives. I don't know if he was using good mic technique or if he was actually using a pop filter. Some of the changes um, that how far would, do you that, think, how far back should he go? Like eight, 10 feet? At least, you know, on the other side of a wall other, would be other ideal. Room. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Okay. Okay. And, and we, that would be we, most <laughs> ideal considering talking about. Now, if you want to talk about actual construction, I do have uh, I do have a one constructive thing at the very very end uh, on this. Actually, I'll I'll do it now. 
in this is something that is it's an actual serious thing if you want me to pause. Uh, like Curtis like jump in. What, 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 one second. Just one th just so everyone knows, the sarcasm filter is off right now. So <laughs> oh yeah. Bandrew is a friend of yes. everybody here. He it's runs an amazing channel called Podcastage and yep. he has the Bandrew Says podcast. Okay, Alan, with that context. Okay, with that context, which which you know is is definitely necessary. Um here's what I will tell you. And this is something for everybody to note. I'm going to get serious for a moment. When you're talking about close miking versus backing off just a little bit, things like the TH sound, he said, thank you. He, it, when he says, thank you, it doesn't sound like a th -th 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 -th, thank you. You get close on a mic and it can almost sound like <laughs> or, or <laughs> like if you push your, it. it puts your tongue like in the top of your mouth and almost makes a hiss snake type sound. And so when he said, thank you, it almost sounded like a, you know, a really hard sound. Um, mm -hmm. It's kind of hard to duplicate right here, you know, but um, if you listen back very closely, if you close mic, you got to keep in mind that a lot of the way the microphone picks up, if you get really close to it, it can also change the way that sa sounds sound to certain people of certain countries because uh, in different, uh, with different dialects, even within your own country, with different accents, the way that you naturally hear certain sounds, some people are like, I can't understand what this person from New York is saying. And New Yorkers are like, how could you not? And, you, and they might not understand the way a Southerner talks. It's because we're used to certain words in the way that, the, that, that they're being shaped by your mouth. And Bandrew, when you get close to a mic like that, it, it changes the way some of the words actually do sound. So that's a little bit of a note there that's on the serious note. Um, and it didn't sound like there was much process. His background, um, he did leave the AC on while he was recording, which gave him a noise floor uh, between about negative 58 and negative 61 dBs. There was a lot of uh, dB, rather. There was a lot of mouth clicks and pops. And uh, I think running a uh, an RX D click and clicking output clicks only would probably serve you a lot of justice. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us how you really feel, though. So there you go. There's, there's my the friend thing. Bandrew and uh, some some uh, some helpful criticism and critique for him. Glad that you participated, Bandrew. <laughs> um, thank wow. you. Yes, thank you, Bandrew, so much. Um, we we really do appreciate your uh, contributing to this episode, or this uh, this session here. All right, um, we are about at time, but I just wanted to quickly go around. So, uh, Austin, where do people find you on TikTok and elsewhere? <laughs> at uh, TikTok and Instagram, you can find me at aok.wav. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at aok underscore wav because they don't allow periods uh, in, <laughs> in the naming conventions. Uh, you can also find uh, my uh, podcast. Uh, I help produce and sound design a narrative audio drama called The Legacy Saga. Uh, you can find us anywhere you find podcasts. Thank you so much. All right, Mike. Just Google booth junkie and chances are you're going to find me if you come up with the ones. It's the photo booth people. That's not me, but anything related to audio, <laughs> just search for booth junkie right here. Booth, booth junkie. There it is. There it is. All right. Booth junkie? Booth. booth junkie. Unless it's being DS and then it's booth junkie. Booth. <laughs> and if Andrew says it, it's going to sound more like booth <laughs> because he's going to close mic it. That's right. And you can find Andrew at Podcastage on YouTube yeah. and then Alan. <laughs> oh, well, he's actually podcasters.com also in his oh, whole right. world. Right. Um, I'm uh, soundspeeds.us. I'm also, you know, soundspeeds on YouTube, uh, soundspeeds YT on Twitter. So those are the different places that you can find me. I do a lot of trolling and stuff on Twitter. Um, uh, I I do mostly the the serious type content and stuff like that and, and sound related on YouTube, though. Um, and if you if you find me in any of the professional sound forums and stuff, you'll you'll You'll, You'll see me comment it. out there sometime, yeah. yeah. Yeah, no doubt. No question. Good. <laughs> Thank you all so much. Thank you for those that submitted audio samples. We very much appreciate that. We'll be back. It looks like this was a successful session, I would say. Thank you to our, our panelists for making it so awesome and so much great information. Um, get out there and make some great sound, everybody. And we'll talk to you again really get soon. Get a microphone, go out and record something amazing. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Thank you. Thank and then you. RX it up.